Dr. Russell Blaylock, come share with us. Thank you. Well, I thank all of y'all for coming. I'm going to tell you some things that might shock you, upset you, but it'll change you. And that's the purpose of knowledge, is to change you. One of the things that's in Ecclesiastes that's always stuck in my mind throughout all that I've done is these words. It says, for in wisdom is much grief, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. And we find in this modern world that's true. The more you know, the more grief there is. The more that you increase your knowledge, the more there is sorrow. And that's because it upsets the status quo and you begin to develop some enemies. Well, we're going to talk about some things today like degeneration and aging of the nervous system. Now, when I was in medical school, uh, the general consensus was that degeneration of the brain and degeneration of the body and aging were the same thing. We thought that the brain, as it aged, begins to lose its cells. They begin to die off until the point we reach our 80s or 90s, and then the brain has lost most of its cells. We become demented, unable to move around, and we die. And this is thought to occur in all the other tissues of the body as well. They all degenerate and die as we get older. Well, now we realize that aging and degeneration of the brain are entirely two different things. That aging is not necessarily a loss of these cells. And what I'm going to tell you in this lecture is sort of bring you through what degeneration is. And then we'll end up uh, recapsulizing what the difference between degeneration of the brain and aging of the brain happens to be. Now, in order to understand what we're thinking today in modern medicine and modern science, biological science, all diseases that we find seem to be related to a, a few things. We find this in physics, we find it in all science, that things sort of break down into simple concepts. And the simple concept is that most disease seems to be related to something we call free radicals. Now, free radicals basically are just little hot particles that bounce through cells and they damage everything they touch. If we, for instance, look at this cell, we see the different components. There's a membrane on the outside we call the cell membrane. That's made mostly of fat or lipids. Inside the cell, we see a bunch of little things and their purpose is to manufacture different components of the cell, to keep the cell's energy supply going to secrete special hormones and proteins to send information throughout the body so that we can function. And if you look, you see these little things here. These are called mitochondrion. That's where 95% of all the energy of a cell comes from, these little tiny things. They're almost like separate living organisms inside your cells. They're in every cell of your body. And like I said, they make 95% of the oxygen. But in the process of doing that, about 2 to 3% of that oxygen escapes as free radicals. And these free radicals, as they escape this little mitochondria, and they bounce all over the cell, and anything they touch, they burn. We call it oxidation. So if they hit the DNA, they damage the DNA. If they hit proteins or enzymes in here, they damage them. And if it bounces up and it hits this cell membrane, it sets off a chain reaction. And that chain reaction we call lipid peroxidation. And that's just a slow damage or, or not actual destruction, but damage to the cell membrane, so it changes. When we're young, this cell membrane is very fluid-like. Things float in it. As we get older, this becomes real stiff, and that's part of the aging process. And when it becomes stiff, it's difficult for things to pass in and out of the cell, and that's part of the aging process. Now we talk about the free radicals damaging everything, the first question that pops into your mind, well, where do these things come from? Well, we already said that a lot of them come from metabolism. And we know that if you increase metabolism, you increase the generation of these free radicals. 
And our little friend, the professor here, is running. Uh, he's participating in a marathon, or he's just running for exercise. And what we know is your metabolism begins to increase, you increase more of these free radicals. Now, most people that run uh, six or seven miles every day, five days a week, they think that's really healthy. But what we find is that they have a higher cancer rate, they have a higher degenerative arthritis rate, they have a higher arteriosclerosis rate, and they die of heart attacks and strokes faster than people that don't run that vigorously or exercise that vigorously. People that exercise to the extremes, like in the Iron Man contest, where you uh, go to the point of absolute exhaustion and pass out, and if you've ever watched one of these contests, you'll see them have seizures at the end of the, the run. They'll fall down the ground and have a grand mal seizure. Some go into coma and some have died. The reason is, is because they're producing enormous amounts of free radicals when they're doing that. Now, when you engage in vigorous exercise, your metabolism increases for hours afterwards. So all that time, you're producing all of these free radicals as damaging cells. Now, that's not a call not to exercise. What we find is that moderate exercise, you know, the Bible says moderation in all things. Moderate exercise is the opposite effect. It actually strengthens the cells, strengthens your immune system, improves your blood flow, reduces all of these diseases. So moderate exercise is very healthy and very good. Um, we know that, for instance, just to give you an idea how many of these free radicals are produced, just during normal lifetime at rest, you produce about 10,000 free radicals in each cell in your body, that, uh, and that's every day. If you exercise or you have some other condition that increases free radicals, that goes up to 100,000 every day, or 500,000 every day. When you get sick, your free radical generation goes up tremendously. And the result of all this damage to cells is that they become weaker and weaker with all of this damage over a lifetime. A second cause is chronic stress. We know now that when you have stress, it's not just upsetting to you, but it actually causes physical damage to the body, particularly the brain. And when we look at the effect of stress on the brain, we see that it damages virtually every part of the brain. The deep structures of the brain, the superficial structures of the brain, every part of the brain seems to be involved in this increased free radical gener generation during stress. Now we find something very peculiar. If you have intense stress, but then a period of relaxation afterwards, say the next day, it's really not that harmful. In fact, it actually strengthens your cells. But if you're in, under intense stress day after day after day, you wake up with it, you go to sleep with it, you dream about it, it becomes your life month after month, it is enormously damaging. We see increased cancer rates, increased arteriosclerosis, heart attacks, increased degenerative brain diseases, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, in people who are under intense stress. Now, if we go back to our original chart here and we look at the third thing is inflammation. Now, that's very important because what we're finding is that virtually all degenerative diseases are inflammatory diseases, things we would never think of, like arteriosclerosis, heart attacks, strokes. They're inflammatory diseases. Alzheimer's disease is an inflammatory disease. And when you have inflammation in your body, you produce an enormous flood of these free radicals. They're just pouring out of the cell, damaging everything, damaging the DNA, the cell membrane, your enzymes, your ability to produce energy in your cells is all impaired by this dramatic free radical production. Diseases like lupus, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, all of these chronic inflammatory diseases produce enormous numbers of free radicals and damage. Now let's look at three other things that cause free radical generation. Irradiation. Every time you're exposed to radiation, it produces an enormous number of free radicals. That's how radiation kills you. And you say, well, I don't work in an atomic energy plant and I haven't been around an atomic explosion lately, so I'm probably protected. Well, you've been out in the sun. When you go out in the sun, these are UVA, UVB light uh, rays, they're radiation. When they penetrate the skin, they produce an enormous amount of free radical generation inside of your skin. 
And let's say you go out for the first day of summer, the first week of summer, go to the beach, and you lay down for 30 minutes. Within 30 minutes, the amount of free radicals produced in your skin depletes virtually all the antioxidants in your skin. And what happens? You burn. Sunburn is a very good example of the power, the destructive power of free radicals. Your skin becomes red and inflamed and painful. You can't stand to put your shirt on or your blouse on because of the intense pain from these free radicals that have been generated. If you stay out in the sun longer, your skin will start to blister, and if you stay out longer than that, it'll start to ulcerate and die. So free radicals, in terms of irradiation from sun, are very powerful. You can end up in the intensive care unit if you stay out in the sun too long. Another way you get exposed to radiation is if you have x-rays. They say you go to the hospital and you're going to get a chest x-ray. When those x-rays pass through your body, they produce free radicals. And with a chest x-ray, it's really not that much radiation, not that many free radicals and not that much damage. But let's say you go to the doctor and you go to the, get your x-ray and you're going to have an upper GI series, lower GI series, a gallbladder series, a chest CT scan. Oh, while you're there, let's go ahead and get that mammogram you forgot to get last year. Well, by the time you've gotten all those x-rays, you have gotten a substantial dose of radiation. You have produced a lot of free radicals in your body, and you've produced uh, changes in the DNA of your cell that could lead to cancer later, even 10 years, 20 years later. So there's some substantial risk to having a lot of x-rays done. Now, this is not a call to refuse x-rays. What you have to do, as we'll go along in the lecture, is there's ways to defend, uh, to increase your defense against these things by increasing your body's antioxidants capacity. Uh, another way you get exposed to intense radiation is if you have a cancer, and they're going to treat this cancer with radiation therapy. That's how it works. When the radiation goes through the cancer cells, it produces enormous amounts of free radicals in the cancer cell, and it burns the cell up. It kills it. Unfortunately, it scatters some of that radiation to the normal cells around uh, the cancer. That produces damage to your normal cells, and that's why we see a fair number of people who have cancer treatment with radiation come back with a secondary cancer. Uh, chemotherapy does the same thing. Chemotherapy also increases free radical generation enormously, and often that's how it kills the cancer cell. Unfortunately, it also kills bone marrow cells and all other cells, liver cells, uh, are also damaged by the chemotherapy. And there's final result of all of this free radical damage where these little particles are bouncing all through the cell, as our little professor shows you, is that it produces a sick cell. How do we protect ourselves against all of this free radical damage that's naturally going on every day Ever since you were born, ever since you were conceived until the time you die, you're going to produce free radicals and you're going to be exposed to them. Well, the body has an, an incredible, efficient antioxidant system to prevent damage by free radicals. Now, the way that God constructed it, uh, the way he constructs everything is quite brilliant. It's a three-tier system that all works together. Most of us are familiar with the vitamins because that's what you see on television. They say take your antioxidants, vitamin C, vitamin E, uh, beta carotene. Well, these are powerful antioxidants, but they're not the only ones. Vitamin D, vitamin K, minerals, magnesium, zinc, selenium, they're all powerful antioxidants. They all work in different parts of the cell. They each have a particular job to do in different parts of the cell. But that's not the whole story. We also have special enzymes that are located throughout all the cells and tissues of our body, and their function is also to neutralize these free radicals so that they won't do damage. And a third tier, some special type molecules, the most important of which are these two, glutathione and alpha-lipoic acid. It won't be a test after this lecture, so you don't have to remember these names. But uh, these are extremely, extremely powerful antioxidants. We know that the level of glutathione in your body determines your sensitivity or likelihood of developing cancer. We know that the glutathione levels in your brain cells determines whether or not you're going to get Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease. Uh, Alpha-lipoic acid is about as close to a miracle antioxidant as you can get. 
uh, it neutralizes virtually every kind of free radical, and there's multiple types of free radicals, over a dozen of them. Uh, it neutralizes all those different types of free radicals. It also restores the ability of vitamin C and vitamin D and vitamin E to be antioxidants. Now, every time vitamin C, for instance, interacts with a free radical, it becomes oxidized, and vitamin C becomes a free radical. It's not as powerful as the other ones, but it is. So if you just take vitamin C, you're actually doing harm because that vitamin C will gradually oxidize and become a, an oxidant, and it will do damage. That's why God made this elaborate system we have here, is because it all works together. Vitamin C restores vitamin E. Vitamin E restores vitamin C. Alpha-lipoic acid restores them all. Now let's look at uh, oxidative stress and brain aging. What is the effect of all this oxidation in the brain? Well, what we see is that it's one of the big effects is on DNA. And we see that when uh, free radicals increase with aging, there's actually a fourfold increase in this oxidation of DNA. So after middle age, your DNA oxidizes four times faster than someone who's 20 or 30 years of age. Now the mitochondria and those little things that produce all the energy in the cell, they're so important they have their own DNA. They don't need the cell's DNA. And they oxidize 10 times faster than DNA inside of the cell. So it undergoes very rapid oxidation. We know that after age 70, your DNA uh, actually oxidizes 15 times faster than it does when you were 20. So as we age, we become more and more sensitive to these free radicals, so the damage increases almost exponentially. And shockingly, we find that the sensitivity of the brain to oxidation is higher even when your antioxidant levels are normal. And that's because you've gone a lifetime with damage from these free radicals from the day that you were born. So these cells are weaker. And that means that you need antioxidant levels that are even higher. Now let's look at why the brain uh, is so vulnerable to aging and degeneration. And it is more so than most organs in the body. It ages somewhat faster. Number one is because the brain has the highest content of polyunsaturated fats of any organ in the body. Now polyunsaturated fat means that it's easy to oxidize. If you expose a polyunsaturated fat to oxygen, it becomes rancid. Most of us are familiar with the odor of rancid fat. That's the milk that goes rancid. So the brain has a very high content of this very sensitive fat. We know also that as we grow older, the amount of iron in our brain begins to increase. Now, you've probably been told most of your life that iron is wonderful. Well, iron is critical to human life, but it's also very damaging. As we get older, iron becomes a problem, not a solution. Iron is one of the most powerful generators of free radicals that we know of. Uh, it undergoes certain reactions inside of the cell that promotes the development of very, very powerful free radicals. And so the old advertisements where they tell you to take your Geritol, they went for iron shots to increase your strength and increase your health, particularly after age 50, were wrong. That increases your risk of heart attack, stroke, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, arthritis, every disease that has to do with degeneration of tissues is significantly increased if your iron increases. Now women have a built-in protection system. During the time that they're having their periods, they get rid of extra iron. Once they stop, once they undergo menopause, they actually accumulate iron faster than men do. And that is one of the principal reasons why women after menopause have such a high incidence of heart attack and stroke because of the accumulation of iron, the iron triggering the free radical generation. And we know that the brain, because of its high fat content and its high oxygen content and its high iron content, is very dependent on antioxidants. If the antioxidants in the brain fall, even for short periods of time, it produces enormous damage to the brain. 
can be permanent damage sometimes. Uh, we know that the brain has an enormously high metabolic rate, one of the highest metabolic rates of the organ, of any organ in the body. And what did we say? We said that metabolism is one of the chief causes for free radical generation. And finally, the brain uses only one fuel. It uses glucose. It has no other fuel that can keep it alive. Now, it can use other fuels less efficiently, but not enough to stay alive. Now, the reason that the brain ages is because of a lifetime exposure to free radicals. From the time you're born, your brain is being assaulted by these free radicals. And by age 50, the assault has been rather substantial. Age 65, age 75, it's really building up fast. And that's one of the problems. We also see that the because of all this free radical damage, the brain has an impaired ability to produce energy. And energy is what allows you to think and reason and laugh and move and walk and do all the things you know that the brain makes you do. So as the brain undergoes all of this damage over a lifetime, can no longer produce its energy as efficiently, you start having trouble thinking, you have trouble remembering, you have trouble orienting yourself, you get lost when you go to the store, you forget how to get back home. All of these things are signs that the brain has impaired ability to produce energy. Plus we, unfortunately, in a Western society, are exposed to a lot of things we know uh, worsen all of this process. These are toxins, things like pesticides. Pesticides are now being found to be infinitely more toxic than we ever dreamed they were in very tiny doses. And there's a dramatic demonstration that recently appeared in the journal Neurology, which is the chief journal of neurological science. What they found was an elderly lady came to the hospital uh, having very advanced neurological disease, sudden onset. It's a very puzzling case. They called in a neurologist, they worked her up, and they said, well, there's no question this lady has very advanced Parkinson's disease. And they said, well, this is unheard of. This is a sudden onset. Day before yesterday, she was fine, and now suddenly she's advanced Parkinson's disease. That usually takes 10 years or 15 years to develop. They eventually discovered, from looking at other cases, the reason she had the Parkinson's disease because she was spraying bug spray around her house. She eventually recovered after staying in the hospital for over a month. She went back home healthy, doing fine. As soon as she walked in the house, she developed Parkinson's disease again. She left her house, recovered. Her family went in, scrubbed the house from top to bottom, cleaned everything. She went back in and immediately developed Parkinson's disease. She left her home permanently, and then she got to thinking, well, there's a blouse I have at my old house I really like, and I'd like to have it back. So her family went and got the blouse, she put it on, and she immediately developed Parkinson's disease. So just that small amount of pesticide was enough to induce severe advanced Parkinson's disease. That didn't affect her husband, so she was sensitive, more sensitive than her husband. So we don't know who sitting in this audience has a high sensitivity to pesticides. Another thing that has recently been discovered that was reported in the Journal of Neuroscience was that you become hypersensitive to pesticides if you're exposed as an infant or a child even in utero, inside of your mother. So if you're exposed to these powerful uh, uh, pesticides early in life, it somehow programs the genes so that later in your life, if you're exposed again, you're likely to develop serious neurological disease. Other things we're exposed to is fluoride. We've recently found that fluoride is a very powerful poison to the brain even in the amounts that they're putting in water, if combined with aluminum, which is in water mostly, you find that it produces destruction of many brain cells. The amount of fluoride in toothpaste is much higher. If you look at the amount that they're adding to water, it's about two to six parts per million. If you look at the amount they put in toothpaste, it's 1,500 parts per million. If you'll read the little warning on the toothpaste, toothpaste tube, it says, warning, supervise the brushing of teeth of a child under age four. If the child swallows this toothpaste, call poison control. 
Children have died from swallowing toothpaste that has fluoride in it. When they brush their teeth, it coats their teeth, it coats their gum, and no matter how much they spit and gargle, they're swallowing it in very high concentrations, high enough to destroy brain cells. And we now have good evidence that it impairs brain function uh, in children. Aluminum is also a very powerful free radical generator. They, you'll find out they put it in food, they put it in, in acids. If you cook in it, it enters the food and you consume it. Aluminum is increased in all the degenerative brain diseases. It's increased in Alzheimer's disease, ALS, Lou Gehrig disease. It's increased in Parkinson's disease. Every degenerative brain disease, you have elevated aluminum levels. Iron, we talked about, very powerful toxin to the brain. And excitotoxins, probably a new word for a lot of y'all who haven't read my book or heard me lecture before. Excitotoxin is a substance that causes brain cells to become enormously excited to the point they'll exhaust themselves and die. And we're finding that there are a lot of excitotoxins being added to food. Some of them you're familiar with, like MSG. Some are less familiar to you, like L-cysteine, a proline, uh, homocysteine, all these different amino acids, when they're found free and in the food, are very powerful brain toxins. The other reason that the brain ages is because we undergo a lifetime of chronic stress and with aging we lose our antioxidant protection. We know that after age 28 the antioxidants in the brain and the body begin to decrease so that by the time we're age 50, 60, we've lost a lot of our antioxidant protection. Now, if you look at the degenerative process, this is for colon cancer, but you can superimpose on this arthritis, diabetes, hypertension, heart attack, stroke, any disease you want to can be superimposed on this graph. And basically what it shows, this is age zero, in other words, when you were born, and this is about age 55, you see something dramatic happen. This is the onset of disease. We see that as you reach age 50 and 55, Suddenly, these degenerative diseases increase enormously. Up until that time, they're quite uncommon. Now, most of us say, when you reach 50, you know, things are hurting that never hurt before. I'm falling apart. So it's like everything's going wrong just because I celebrated my 50th birthday or my 55th birthday. Well, there's a lot of truth in that. And that's because from age zero, to age 50, you've undergone a lifetime of free radical damage to your body. So that by the time you reach 50, you've run out of room. The cell can't accommodate to all that damage any longer. And when that happens, everything starts falling apart because the cell has just about reached the limit. Its cell membrane is no longer fluid. The DNA has been seriously damaged. It can't produce energy as well. And so you begin to develop diseases arthritis, hypertension, diabetes, heart attack, stroke, uh, cancer, all of these things start to appear about that time. Now if you look at a brain, this is a nice healthy brain. Um, that's what you want your brain to look like. This is not what you want it to look like. This is a disease similar to Alzheimer's disease, but what you see is this is what the healthy part of the brain looks like. And this is shrunken and shriveled. This is where all your memory occurs. This is where you interrelate all of your different memories, what things smell like, what they taste like, what they sound like. It's a very important part of the brain, terribly shrunken. This is what happens in Alzheimer's disease. Now the brain needs three things. Mainly, it needs a lot of things, but these are three things that it absolutely has to have. It has to have energy, it has to have magnesium, and it has to have antioxidants. Now, the second of these is the most ignored, even by the physicians. Yet there's an enormous amount of literature in the medical journals about the, the very incredible power of magnesium to prevent disease. Doctors don't read it because it doesn't have a pharmaceutical name on it. Um, your brain without energy cannot exist. It's highly energy dependent. 
It doesn't move, it doesn't walk around, it just sits there. If you look at it, it looks like a bowl of jelly in a living person. But it has to have energy, and it has to generate this energy. As we get older, we lose some of the ability to generate energy in the brain. But if you undergo normal, healthy aging, even to age 100, the ability of the brain to produce energy hardly decreases at all. It's only when there's pathological aging, that is, when it's not normal, that you begin to lose energy in your brain. One of the first things you see in Alzheimer's disease is a loss of energy in the brain. 10 years before you ever develop any symptom. We have a way to measure that with a PET scanner, positron emission scan. 10 years before they develop the first symptom, you can see that those parts of the brain that will be affected are already losing their energy supply. And they're also losing their antioxidants. Magnesium is one of the most powerful protectants of the brain. It can protect the brain against every kind of insult you can imagine, a stroke, a blunt trauma, uh, any kind of disease, and it's decreased in every disease of the brain. Third is antioxidants, and we've already talked about antioxidants and how important they are to the brain. Now let's take a look at Alzheimer's disease, just to see what happens in this disorder. If we look at Alzheimer's disease, it is a chronic inflammatory disease of the brain. That's what it is. And we discover that by, quite by accident. They were looking at some patients who had rheumatoid arthritis, who took anti-inflammatory drugs. And they found that the incidence of Alzheimer's disease in these patients was six to 12 times lower than anyone else. And then they looked at people who had leprosy. They take a drug called Dapsone, which is a powerful antiox uh, antioxidant and anti-inflammatory. And they found the same thing with them. They had a very, very low incidence of Alzheimer's disease, no matter what their age. And so they realized that there's some inflammatory going on in the brain in Alzheimer's disease. And then they started looking at other things associated with inflammation. They found that all cases of Alzheimer's disease have elevated iron levels. They all have elevated aluminum levels. They all have elevated free radicals. They all have elevated lipid peroxidation, that destruction of the cell membrane. They all have decreased energy and they all have increased sensitivity to those things in the food we talked about, excitotoxins, and they all had very low magnesium levels in that parts of their brain that were involved. So the pattern fits for Alzheimer's disease. Well, let's look at Parkinson's disease. Again, we see the result is a lifetime of injury by free radicals that produces the disease in this particular part of the brain. And one of the earliest changes is the loss of that antioxidant that I tell you is the most important antioxidant in the body, glutathione. It's lost before you develop any symptoms. You don't even know you have Parkinson's disease. It's 10 years away. The glutathione level starts to fall. Second thing is the iron level in the brain starts to rise, particularly in that part of the brain. And they think, and what studies show, is that people who have Parkinson's disease have abnormal metabolism in the brain for iron. So they tend to accumulate iron. Then we see a loss of the antioxidants in the brain. We also saw that in Alzheimer's disease. So the brain can no longer protect itself. And we see the same thing with Alzheimer's disease, a loss of the ability of those cells to produce energy. It's thought that excitotoxins play a major role in Parkinson's disease as well. Both of these diseases are thought to be caused by excitotoxins. These are excitatory things like glutamate, aspartate, homocysteine. And that's because excitotoxins produce enormous amounts of free radicals in the brain and other tissues. Now again, it's back to what we said. The accumulated damage to the brain by pesticides, aluminum, fluoride, mercury, iron, lead, copper, all of which you get through your food, get through your water, and spray around your house. We know food additives like monosodium glutamate, aspartame, carrageenan. If you look on some of your foods, particularly ice cream, you'll see a name called carrageenan. It is a very powerful inflammatory chemical. We use it experimentally to produce inflammation and study inflammation. They put it in food now. It is also considered a procarcinogen. Um, 
We have advancing arteriosclerosis because of all this free radical generation, and the brain needs a lot of blood. It has to have glucose, it has to have oxygen, and it has to get rid of toxins. So if the amount of blood going to the brain is not proper, which occurs with hardening of the arteries or arteriosclerosis, the brain is impaired, and we lose energy in the brain. Touch on iron again because I think you, you really need to know this, that iron is dangerous after a certain age. After you reach age 40 or 45, unless you have documented iron deficiency anemia, you should not take iron. Uh, iron accumulates in the brain the older you get. It's a powerful generator of free radicals. It's associated with all the degenerative brain diseases, and it is known that it uh, cancer is also very dependent on iron. It makes cancer grow faster, it makes cancer spread faster, and it makes tumors much more aggressive. Now a recent, a recent study on iron showed that if, when they examined 100 people who had had a stroke, they found that 48% of them deteriorated after that stroke within 48 hours. In other words, they didn't just have the stroke and stay there, they got worse. And when they looked at the people that got worse, they found all of them had higher iron levels than the ones that did not progress. And the study demonstrated that if you had even high normal iron levels, it increased your risk of deteriorating after a stroke 33 times. So you, now if you turn that around, if you have a lower iron level, you reduce your risk of getting worse after a stroke by 33-fold. Now this is a concept, isolated brain hypoglycemia, that most doctors are not aware of, but it does occur. Hypoglycemia is low blood sugar. And you know, most people that's experienced low blood sugar know the jitteriness, the difficulty thinking, uh, you get disoriented those sort of things. Well, it's been discovered that the brain can be hypoglycemic when the rest of the body has normal sugar. And that's because glucose has to be transported into the brain. And as we age, as we develop certain conditions like Alzheimer's disease, we're exposed to free radicals and excitotoxins, all impair the ability of glucose to enter the brain. So if you're getting these symptoms and you go to a doctor and he draws your blood sugar and he says, well, your blood sugar's just fine, that doesn't mean that your brain's getting the glucose it needs. We find that often, particularly in Alzheimer's disease, a lot of the symptoms resemble hypoglycemia. Magnesium. Magnesium plays a vital role in every cell in your body. It's responsible for uh, helping out as a cofactor 300 enzymes in your body, many, many of which have to do with energy. And a lot of people that are magnesium deficient, one of the first things they notice when you give them magnesium is they have a lot more energy than they had before. It is a powerful antioxidant. It protects the brain against excitotoxicity, that is, these damage by these excitotoxins in the brain. It's very sensitive to magnesium. If magnesium is low, it increases sensitivity to excitotoxins a hundredfold. A recent survey of 37,000 normal people walking around found that 75% of them were deficient in magnesium. Three-fourths of those were severe deficiencies. If you have a heart attack and you have a low magnesium, there's a good chance you're gonna die of that heart attack. If you have a stroke and you have a low magnesium, it dramatically increases your risk, you'll die from that stroke. Magnesium can lower blood pressure, Recently, it's found that it prevents fat from entering the walls of blood vessels, so it may prevent arteriosclerosis, uh, that is, heart attacks and strokes. It's been found to strengthen the bones significantly. It prevents migraine headaches, uh, when, particularly when you combine magnesium with riboflavin, uh, the uh, vitamin. It is a very powerful preventative of uh, migraine headaches. Just to give you an example of the power of magnesium to prevent stroke problems, this is a slice of a brain, of a human brain. If you shut off a blood vessel that feeds this side of the brain, what you see is in this blue area, I should have made it bluer, 
but about that much brain will die when you shut that artery off. That's what a stroke is. If you feed this same person a high intake of magnesium and do the same thing, only this little red area will die. The rest of this will survive. And if you do this in animals, you find the ones that you don't give magnesium is a very high mortality. About half of them will die and the rest will be crippled. The ones you give magnesium, all of them will survive and most of them won't have any neurological deficit at all. So magnesium is very protective of the brain. Same thing in the heart. If we look at the heart, if you shut off a blood vessel to the heart, the blue area, all of this wall of the heart will die. That's what a heart attack is. If you take this same uh, person, give them a high dose of magnesium, only the little red area will die or even smaller. So the chances that they'll die from the heart attack are much greater with low magnesium than with high magnesium and the severity of the heart attack will be greatly diminished by magnesium. Now let's look at some bad fats and some good fats because there's a lot of confusion about this. There's basically what we need to know, there's, there's fats that increase inflammation, increase disease, associated with all the diseases we've talked about, and there's, there's fats that do the opposite. The bad fats are called N6 or omega-6 type fats. That's corn oil, safflower oil, sunflower oil, soybean oil, peanut oil, and canola oil. Now that list, canola oil, is the least bad. The rest of these are very bad. The good fats are called omega-3 fatty acids, or N6 fats. That includes fish oils, DHA, EPA, flaxseed oil. Over the last 70 years, we've had an 80% reduction in the uh, intake of the good fats. We virtually eliminated them from our diet. At the turn of the century, the ratio of the good fats to the bad fats was one to one, or about four to one, somewhere between that. Now it's about 25 to one in favor of bad fats to 45 to one in favor of bad fats. Let's take a look at what happens with bad fats. We know that the bad fats, these omega-6 fats, dramatically increase inflammation. We said Alzheimer's disease, inflammatory disease. Most degenerative diseases are inflammatory diseases. So it dramatically increases inflammation. If you have rheumatoid arthritis and you're consuming a lot of these fats, your rheumatoid arthritis is gonna be dramatically worse. If you have lupus, you're gonna be dramatically worse. If you have Alzheimer's disease, you're gonna be dramatically worse. We know that these fats are powerful inhibitors of the immune system, extremely powerful. You can take a certain strain of rat that never metastasizes cancer. In other words, it will not spread from where the tumor is. If you feed them corn oil, it will spread all over their body. We know from multiple scientific examinations that all of these oils dramatically promote the growth of cancer and the spread of cancer and they make the cancer much more aggressive. If you're consuming a high intake of them, you're more likely to die from your cancer. We know that it dramatically accelerates arteriosclerosis, so you're more likely to have a heart attack and a stroke if you consume these oils. Uh, we know that they promote uh, free radical production and worsen the damage by free radicals. And they're associated with all the degenerative brain diseases. Now what about the good fats? Well, they sort of do the opposite thing. They stimulate the immune system, make it stronger. They inhibit the formation and growth of cancer and spread of cancer. They reduce inflammation. They're very good anti-inflammatories. They improve the memory of the elderly. They may pre actually prevent Alzheimer's dementia and Parkinson's disease. And they are absolutely essential for the development of the normal brain. So I've seen a lot of small children, some pregnant ladies out here. Uh, these oils are critical for the formation of a baby's brain. Now the book I wrote is called Excitotoxins, The Taste That Kills. And most people look at this and have no earthly idea what that is. The reporter yesterday was and it was sort of like a deer in the headlights. 
She had no idea what I was talking about. I didn't create the term excitotoxins. It's created by a neuroscientist. It is now mentioned in all the literature that has anything to do with degenerative brain diseases. Excitotoxins are considered to be the key element for all degenerating brain conditions. And that's because excitotoxins produce enormous amounts of free radicals. It may be that they also increase your cancer risk. It may be that it plays a major role in mild development of the brain. Uh, things that are put in your food is basically what the book is about. And this is MSG, monosodium glutamate, L-cysteine, homocysteine. Uh, all of these things are being added to food now and they all produce destruction of the brain. Also, it's about NutraSweet. So basically, we're going to concentrate on the effect for a few minutes of the excitotoxins on brain. These are the big lies by the government and by the industries that make these things. And they, they've gone through a litany of lies as the scientific information has come out that demonstrates how damaging it is in your food. Number one, they say, well, there's only a small amount of MSG in food, nowhere near the amount that produces these lesions experimentally. Well, it's now been shown through several experiments that humans indeed do get this much MSG in their food, particularly small children, unborn children. Children uh, are four times more sensitive to it than adults. As you begin to get older, your sensitivity goes up again so that you're again very highly sensitive to the toxicity of MSG, monosodium glutamate. The brain is protected by the blood-brain barrier was their next defense. They said it, it won't let this amino acid into the brain so it's protected so it's not going to hurt you anyway. Well, we know that part of the brain has no blood-brain barrier at all, so it can seep in that way, and that's been demonstrated. The second thing we discovered was that if you increase the blood levels over a long period of time, it'll go through the normal blood-brain barrier. And the third thing we found is that there are a lot of diseases in humans that are associated with impaired blood-brain barrier. For instance, multiple sclerosis, hypertension, diabetes, exposure to free radicals. All of these things produce an opening of the blood-brain barrier so this toxin can enter you. If you take multiple sclerosis patients and they eat food that has high MSG content in it, they will get dramatically worse for weeks afterwards. If you keep it out of their diet, they'll do much, much better. Then they came along, well, carbohydrates completely protect the brain against this toxicity. First they said there was no toxicity, now we, they found something that could protect you against it. Uh, I looked up the article and read the article in which they quoted about the protection by carbohydrates, that is starches. You would have to eat 14 soda crackers or about seven slices of bread every time that you took in some MSG to get near the protection, the protection was not complete. The animal still had brain lesions. Then they said MSG is not absorbed intact. Well, that's been disproven. And the greatest lie of all, you can trust the FDA. Because <laughs> I will assure you the FDA is in the pocket of big industry. Now let's talk about silent brain lesions. A lot of people say, well, you know, I can eat MSG, it doesn't bother me, I'm not sensitive to it or I'm not allergic to it. MSG sensitivity is not, I emphasize, an allergy. It is a toxin, a poison, like arsenic and cyanide. You do not have some people sensitive, others not. Now your sensitivity may vary, but it is a toxin, not an allergy. The other thing is, because you feel nothing when you're consuming it doesn't mean it's not destroying your brain cells. If I increase your lead content, it will gradually destroy your brain and you won't know it until you reach the point where you've lost a lot of your brain function. If I give you arsenic for a long time in low doses, you won't know it until you begin to develop cancers and neurological problems over many years. Same thing with MSG. It's a slow process that gradually builds up and destroys these brain cells. And it's the same brain cells that are destroyed in Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease and these other diseases. The other thing, it is not the Chinese restaurant syndrome we're talking about. A lot of people say, well, MSG is Chinese restaurant syndrome. 
That is something outside of the brain. Not everybody develops that. Everybody develops the toxicity to the brain, whether you develop this Chinese restaurant symptoms or not. The toxicity, I said, can occur suddenly or it can occur over a long period of time. Some people go out and eat, they get a high MSG meal, they develop severe headache, they get cardiac arrhythmias, their heart's beating abnormally. Some people have died of a heart attack from eating MSG, quite a few because it produces intense arrhythmias of the heart and they'll drop dead after eating a meal and no one associates it with MSG, which experimentally you can do this in animals, particularly if their magnesium is low. The longer the exposure to MSG and the higher the dose, the worse the effect. Now what do these excitotoxins do in the nervous system? Well, one of the most frightening thing they do is they do to small children, undeveloped children, particularly when they're in the mother's uterus, is it makes the brain develop abnormally. They've done this repeatedly. The little connections, all these different fibers that connect the synaptic connections don't make the proper connection. We find that it causes all sorts of things, like one of the most common thing is morbid obesity. And we're seeing a 600% increase in obesity in children. It causes an obesity that has uh, some uh, repeatable characteristics. It's very difficult to diet away. It's almost impossible to exercise away. It's associated with outburst of violence and it's associated with learning difficulties. So we're seeing this in our own children because the FDA has decided we're going to have this giant worldwide experiment with MSG toxicity. We know that if you feed MSG to animals, it destroys particular types of brain cells, particularly those that have to do with memory, those that have to do with certain types of movement, which leads to Parkinson's disease, and those that have to do with endocrine secretion, that is thyroid hormone, adrenal hormone, growth hormone. They're all severely affected by MSG, even in doses that are not high enough to destroy the cell, it can still produce it. And a really frightening thing I found was that if you take MSG and expose the hypothalamus of the brain to it, it produces a profound suppression of the immunity that lasts the entire lifetime of that animal. And we're seeing an explosion of immune deficiency in people nowadays, not related to AIDS, but we're seeing a lot of the chronic fatigue syndrome, which is an immune deficiency. We're seeing a lot of different immune problems. And I think it's related certainly in part to this. Some other things we find that if you feed MSG to small children or before they're born, it impairs the development of their endocrine system, so their reproductive system does not work normally, their thyroid does not work normally, depresses the immunity for life. It can produce abnormal cholesterol and triglycerides later in life, if you expose them early in life. There's a good strong relationship to ADD and ADHD, autism, dyslexia, and emotional discontrol that is outburst of violence. If you inject MSG in micromolar, that's a millionth of a uh, dose into the uh, area of the hypothalamus, you can produce rage reactions, and it produces this severe obesity. Now, if you look at MSG's effect on the learning ability of children, when we do it in experimental animals and do very careful testing, what they find is that if you feed the mother MSG, not the baby, but the mother, once the child is born and you test that child for simple learning capacity, it seems to be perfectly normal. But when they tested the offspring for complex learning ability, it was severely impaired. And this has been repeated and the same thing was found. It caused significant impairment of complex learning. And this is what allows you to excel in life. So your child may be able to get through the first few grades of school without any difficulty when they get into the higher math and the courses that require more intense cognitive function, they're impaired. It can cause a premature onset of puberty in certain doses and we know that it damages the genetics of the cell, not just the brain, but of all cells in the body so that genetic damage will be passed on to the next generation. 
And what's frightening about all of this is that you have to realize when the mother is consuming this food full of these excitotoxins, she's exposing the baby to nine months of toxicity. The growth of the brain in a child, the most rapid growth is the last trimester and the first two years after birth. That's when the brain undergoes what we call a growth spurt. So it's very sensitive to these things during that period. At age four, the brain has only reached 80% of its growth. At age eight, it's only reached 90% of its growth. You continue to form brain pathways until you die. You never stop redesigning your brain. These little synapses are always designed. And that's why it's dangerous at any age, because it interferes with the ability of the brain to do that. In a recent study, it was shown that in pregnant animals, if you give them MSG, the amount of MSG in the baby, the fetus, is twice as high as that in the mother. So the placenta is concentrating it on the baby's side uh, of the placenta. We found it increased the risk of seizures once the baby's born. In 1969, a single jar of baby food had glutamate levels, that is the toxic excitotoxin, 25 times higher than you find in a mother's milk. These are some of the disguised names of MSG. The industry once started putting out the word and once this book was published, they realized they had a problem and people were beginning to recognize that MSG was dangerous, so they changed the name and the FDA allows them to do that. As long as it's less than 99% MSG, they can call it anything they want to. And so this is a list of the little benign sounding names that they've chosen to call it. Natural flavoring, hydrolyzed vegetable protein, textured protein, soy protein extract, yeast extract, spices, carrageenan, portobello mushrooms I want to warn you about. I don't know how many of you love portobello mushrooms. The reason it flavors food and tastes so good because it's very high in glutamate. Glutamate MSG is a taste enhancing substance. That's all it does. Doesn't preserve food, doesn't do anything else. It adds taste. It will make a terrible tasting recipe taste delicious. Unfortunately, and not everybody in here is gonna like this, but tofu is very high in glutamate. There's a recent study that was completed, a 30-year study. People who consumed the most tofu had the greatest brain degeneration and the greatest dementia. They, at the present time, say they don't know why, but it's a good study. There was other studies that indicated the same thing, and I think it's because of the very high glutamate. Now, a lot of people eat tofu because they think it prevents breast cancer. Tofu does not contain Guinistine. Guinistine is what people uh, in the scientific world associate with reduction of breast cancer and ovarian cancer. Uh, when it's processed as a bean curd, you lose the guinistine. So you're not even getting any of it or very low levels of it when you're consuming tofu anyway. What you're consuming is a high concentration of glutamate and it's free glutamate. That's why it tastes like meat and you can exchange it for meat because MSG has a meat-like flavor. Um, that makes it very dangerous for developing children. I would caution people not to consume a lot of tofu, particularly the ladies when you're pregnant. Your small children shouldn't be consuming tofu because it'll affect the brain formation. Um, now, if you occasionally want to uh, taste it or a small amount of it, that might be all right. That's what I understand the Japanese do. They don't eat it in huge amounts like we do. We tend to overdo things. Processed foods, high in excitotoxins, salad dressings, commercial salad dressings, particularly diet dressings, diet drinks, Coke, Pepsi, Crystal Light is, seems to be one of them that's most associated with seizures. Uh, diet foods, because they're low fat, they lose their taste, so they have a lot of excitotoxins to them. Commercial soups are just about all have a excitotoxin. I have not found one yet that doesn't. Campbell's soup's one of the worst. Uh, check recently, they had four different excitotoxins added to a single can of soup. And we know that when you add them as individual components, they're infinitely more toxic. They're also more toxic if they're in a liquid form. 
And the thing that everyone loves now, you see just being heavily promoted, is the liquid dietary supplements, Ensure, Slim Fast. They also have a lot of excitotoxins in them. Now to cheer you up a little bit more, let's go. <laughs> let's go to aspartame. Uh, aspartame, NutraSweet, equal. Uh, it's just, you know, you think MSG was bad. This is worse, uh, much worse. When this product was put together, it's made out of three basic components. It's made out of an amino acid called phenylalanine, methanol, which is methyl alcohol, and aspartic acid, which is an excitotoxin. They combine these three. Methyl al alcohol is so poisonous, it's carefully controlled by the EPA, even in very tiny doses. Phenylalanine in high doses produces a disorder called PKU, phenylketonuria, which destroys brain pathways in children producing permanent mental retardation. And aspartic acid and excitotoxin that'll do the same damage that MSG does. Now interestingly, when G.D. Searle, the company that made aspartame originally, when they did their original study, it was not approved by the FDA, a group of panel met, which had pathologists, neuropathologists, neuroscientists on it. They looked at the data. It indicated from their own study, there was a dramatic increase in brain tumors in the animals that were exposed to aspartame, and they used low doses, medium doses, and high doses, and all of them it was increased. A 47-fold increase in brain tumors, uh, as well as tumors of the ovaries, testes, uterus, breast, thyroid, and pancreas. So it produced multiple cancers throughout the body. Now when this study came out and they lost their approval, they immediately repeated this test. And then they came out with a dramatic said, oh, we don't know what happened on the first test, but the new one shows that it didn't produce any increase in tumor. Well, a neuroscientist looked at it and it looked a little fishy because the control animals now were developing as many tumors as the ones that originally were exposed to NutraSweet. Well, the government investigated this, and it's uh, written up in a report called the Bressler Report, which causes the Monsanto company to have uh, apoplexy. But in this report, they discovered that the tumors were being removed and thrown away and called normal. Uh, they found that the uh, feeds were being switched so that the control animals were also being fed NutraSweet. But when the panel re-met, the panel had three or four neuroscientists on it, one of which was a very famous neuroscientist, probably one of the greatest names in neuroscience. They recommend it not be approved. It was approved over their objection by the person who was the chairman. And interestingly, three months later, he went to work for the GD Serial Companies advertising firm, left the FDA. That's happened multiple times. That's not the first incidence of that. Now, what does aspartame do? Well, we know it's a powerful mutagen. That is, it damages DNA, particularly when it's ingested. We also know that the, the methanol in uh, NutraSweet breaks down into two products, formic acid, which is the poison that fire ants sting you with, and formaldehyde, which they used to embalm people with. Now the formaldehyde concentration is low, but recent study in which they radio labeled it, that is they attached a radioactive tracer to the methanol that was in NutraSweet to see where it went, they found out it, the uh, formaldehyde attached to the DNA and produced multiple breaks in the DNA and that it was an accumulative effect. And what that means to you is that if you say, well, I'm just going to drink one Diet Cola a day, every day you're adding the damage. Formaldehyde is very difficult to get out of the body. Another thing, this phenylalanine amino acid, which we ca said causes brain damage in children, they found that uh, if you measured the phenylalanine levels in the baby during pregnancy, it was twice as high as the mother's level. So if she's drinking Diet Colas, her baby's exposed to twice as high as that. 
But it's like the baby gets two Diet Colas for every one she drinks. And it's been found that people who carry the gene for PKU have twice the blood levels of phenylalanine as normal people. Now, you don't know that you're a PKU carrier. You can only do that through genetic testing. So half the, uh, I mean, one in 50 people in this room is a carrier for PKU and doesn't know it. If they are exposed to NutraSweet, their blood level of this toxic amino acid phenylalanine is twice as high. And their baby is at twice the risk. We know that it increases the risk of seizures, results in a loss of memory, confusion, disorientation, can produce headaches, worsening of multiple sclerosis. They get very bad off after exposure to NutraSweet. Loss of diabetic control is being promoted to diabetics. The nutritional associations and dietetic associations encouraging diabetics to use it, yet there's good evidence it makes them worse. Loss of, uh, they actually gain weight. They found that at least a third of the people on NutraSweet gain weight, and they're taking it to lose weight. And in some people it causes blindness. Now this comes from the FDA's list of complaints. Now the FDA collects complaints about food substances. 75 to 80 percent of all the complaints about anything to do with food in the United States is related to NutraSweet. That shows you how many people are complaining, millions. And only 10% of people that have problems actually write the FDA, according to their own statistics. Now we know that when phenylalanine levels are high, it interferes with the brain formation. Phenylalanine also breaks it down into other products when it's in your body, one of them phenylacetate, which also has been shown to produce abnormal brain development. Now, when phenylalanine uh, increases five-fold higher, you see a 10-point drop in a baby's IQ. A six-fold increase reduces the uh, complex cognitive function by 10%. So it's rather profound. So you say, well, does that ever happen from people drinking NutraSweet? A recent study showed that there was an eight-fold increase in phenylalanine level and 50% of normal people tested with NutraSweet in doses that they can consume. Another study showed, for, uh, if you look at the National Collaborative Study for Maternal uh, PKU, and this is a guideline for women that are pregnant, recommended that the phenylalanine level uh, be less than six milligrams per deciliter to pre prevent brain damage. So they tested normal people and PKU carriers to see uh, what blood levels they attained. 14% of normal people had levels higher than that. So 14% of y'all would have a higher level. If you're a PKU carrier, 35% people were higher. So those of you out here that are PKU carriers and don't know it, uh, your rate's gonna be much higher. 5% of normals were higher than 10 uh, milligrams per deciliter and 12% of carriers were greater than 10. So we're talking about nationwide tens of millions of people whose babies and themselves are at significant risk. The consumption of aspartame continues to climb. It's quadrupled between 1983 and 1988. Diet cola drinkers consume six times as many colas as those who drink sweet colas. And the consumption continues to increase 20 to 25 percent annually. It goes by all these little cute names they've thought up. And this is just my cartoon about what happens when you drink NutraSweet. They like that cartoon. <clears throat> and I'm just going to touch on some brilliant things the government has done. Uh, this is this is one of the. Janet Reno stormtroopers capturing this dangerous little six-year-old. That's a sideways slide. <laughs> this is just a review. You don't have to turn your head. I'll tell you what you uh, Brilliant things the government has done. Adding fluoride, adding aluminum to foods. A lot of foods have aluminum added now. Adding iron to foods. You know, the pasta has iron. Uh, a lot of grains have iron added by law. Approving aspartame, injecting excitotoxins into poultry. Most of y'all don't have to worry about that. Spraying vegetables with MSG. 
And uh, last slide says just about anything else the idiots can think of. <laughs> Finally, let's answer the question, do you lose brain cells with aging? If you age in a healthy way, you don't. A study that was done of people between the ages of 60 and 100 found there was no apparent loss of brain cells with normal aging. So the old idea that you just progressively lose brain cells is not true. As long as you're healthy, you have good antioxidant defenses, good nutrition, avoid the bad fats, avoid the toxins, you can age normally without losing your brain. With Alzheimer's disease, we see a 20% loss of brain cells in mild cases and a 70% loss in severe cases. The mental decline of old age is due to disease, diabetes, vessel disease, there was arteriosclerosis, hypertension, and early Alzheimer's disease. It is a pathological process. So with that, we'll end the scare show today, and tomorrow I'll tell you something that you can do about all of this. Thank you.